Jumping is scary. At times it's going to feel like it's an uncontrollable tumble. But let me tell you this. You'll sit there with that parachute on your back, all them skills you got, and you'll have it packed away and you'll never get cut up. But if you do not jump, you will never soar. If you don't jump, I'm telling you right now, you'll never know. I would jump. You should take a chance. You know, somebody once said you can take all the money in the world out of the hands of everybody, out of all the wealthy people in the world who are really successful, give it to other people. It wouldn't take too long. Those people would have it back in their hands. It's not because they're manipulative. It's because they have a standard. The reason people don't put themselves in a position to fail, the reason people aren't patient, is they value other people's opinions too much. You have to monitor your self-talk. Monitor your self-talk. If you go around people tell people, oh, I have a horrible memory, I'm not smart enough, I'm getting too old, fill in the blank. Take those three magic words and live them. Raise your standard. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. You gotta be willing to do it afraid. See, you might be waiting for the fear to stop. I should leap, leap afraid. You chose to withdraw because you were afraid. You're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility. People are rewarded in public for what they've practiced for years in private. Stand guard to your mind because your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. Your mind is always eavesdropping on your self-talk. I'd rather die leaping than on the edge figuring out how to get the courage to leave. Okay, I'm going to go make this happen. I'm going to go make this much money. I'm going to transform my kids. I'm going to create the ultimate relationship in my life. I'm going to transform my body, whatever it is. And then you don't have strong enough reasons and you don't lose, use it. You don't follow through. It's because you didn't back up your standards with what makes those standards real. And that's rituals. You constantly remind yourself after every defeat, after every setback, Every time you get knocked down, I've got a saying, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. See, a lot of people, because of failure, they stop, they stop believing. Let me share something with you. You will fail your way to success. So many times we're waiting. We're waiting, I'm waiting. Eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. You will fail your way to success. It doesn't matter how many times you fail. It doesn't matter how many times people tell you that you can't do it. It doesn't matter if you don't have a dime in the bank. You will fail your way to success. What's the standard they hold themselves to? And then what are all those little rituals that add up? Because think about it. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. You're just kind of waiting. You're waiting to get everything in order. You're waiting. You're waiting so that everything is, is in you. It's together. You're waiting to not be afraid. You're waiting to have the courage. You're waiting to have all the money. You're waiting. You've got five seconds and that's it. Today. Five seconds gone. Talk yourself out of it. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. All the results in your life are coming from your rituals. Rituals define us. Knowing that you're never going to feel like doing all the work that it takes to have this business be everything that it possibly could. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens. You blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little and stuff. And when you want to do it right and you want to wait till you're not afraid and you want to wait till you have it all together, oh, you made it about you again. See, Nelson Mandela did it. He just did it not knowing if it were right. Mahatma Gandhi just did it not knowing if it were right. Mother Teresa just did it not looking for affirmation or confirmation. Is this right? Martin Luther King did it not even knowing if it would happen before his life ended. What are you waiting on? Are you willing to do it afraid? Are you willing to do it knowing that you got so much work to do to get it better, to get it more perfect? But are you willing to do it inside your imperfection? Do you realize that in your imperfection, you're perfect for the job? Little bite-sized steps, little things you do each day that after you do them, you get so much momentum that it's easy to succeed. You're not overwhelmed. You have these victory day after day after day on little things. The brain is going to screw you over. The brain is going to go into autopilot. The brain is going to tell you it doesn't feel like doing things. 
raise your standard. From the moment that you have the idea, from the second you have that idea, you've only got five seconds to take action. Otherwise, it's gone. There's only one rule when it comes to productivity. There's only one rule when it comes to success. There's only one rule to getting everything you've ever wanted. And here it is. You're never going to feel like it. Ever. In any area of your life that you don't have what you want, whether it's the amount of money, the amount of people on your team, the amount of sales, the amount of trips for your family, the re if you only did the things that you don't feel like doing, you'd have everything you've ever wanted. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. You have these victory day after day after day on little things. If you went through Ultimate Edge, I'm sure you learned about the hour of power or the 15 minutes to be able to be fulfilled or 30 minutes to thrive where you literally just condition your body and emotion with a couple little rituals. So it doesn't matter what's going on in your world, you feel that strength and it's not fake, it's not some pump up. It's coming from inside, I believe, is even more important than intelligence. Intelligence is so important. But there are a lot of very intelligent people that never maximize their capability. How many know somebody very smart that can't fight their way out of a paper bag? Say I. So intelligence is so valuable, but hunger is even more. And if you come to a program like this, I know the hunger is there. But the second thing it requires is a massive amount of energy. Because what I've found in life is many times people have the ability to do things. They know what to do, they just don't do it. And a big part of that is energy. So when I was back there feeling the energy, got the music, it's so quiet in here. You're being quiet right now. Most of you are doing what you've done most of your life when you went to an education environment. And what is that? You're now learning the way you did when you went to a 20th century school. In a 20th century school, what do we learn? The bell rings and what are you supposed to do? Immediately report to your what? Position. And when you get to that position, you're supposed to sit down and start a conversation with the people around you. Is that right? You're supposed to initiate. Is that right? No. When you went to 20th century school, you were taught, sit down, be quiet, be passive, wait till someone tells you what to do. Today, if you wait for someone to tell you what to do, if you don't talk to your neighbor, you're out of business. Who's with me here? Say, I. Ah. So I'd like to change this because how many of you in this room have ever gone to an environment where you learned something that you thought was really, truly valuable. No one sold you on it. You personally thought this is really something that could change my business, change my life. You were excited about it. But when you went home, you literally never applied a bit of what you've learned. Who's ever done this before? Raise your hand, say I. Oh, come on. If you're not raising your hand, you lie about other shit too. Raise your hand, say I. Who's done this more than once in your life? Say I. Who still feels intelligent? Say I. So we're all smart people. Why would smart people learn something, get an environment like this and then not maximize it? It's because we've all been conditioned by our traditional education, which was designed back in the 19th century, 20th century, where you're designed to get a job, where you were supposed to report in a certain position, someone told you what to do, basically it was an assembly line. Today that's not true. So I like to break out of that because research shows if you sit and listen to me passively like you are right now, you're being very nice, smiling, nodding your head, being sweet, I appreciate it. But if you do that, research shows three months from now, you'll remember about 10% of what was said, which basically was wasting your time, wasting mine too. I don't want to waste yours, much less mine. So if you listen and take notes, it jumps up to the 40, 50 percentile, even if you never look at the notes again. Because just writing it down drives the groove deeper. So I'd encourage you to do that. I don't see many of you with any form of notes, but I know you have your phones. Some of you do, but you have no notes. You must not have had a very high expectation of much value coming out of the session, clearly. But thirdly, if you physically engage your body, which is what I like to do, your voice, your body, your energy, engagement is part of what we're going to talk about here in business. It's the most pathetic level in a long time worldwide. Even though we have all these tools for productivity, we have all these tools for distraction. And as a result, most people are not maximizing. So if we want to transform, the thing we really need to be able to shift is get ourselves engaged at a different level. So what I'd like to ask you to do is from here on out, if you're willing to, is let's start with some energy. Because let me ask you a question. If you have two people in a relationship, let's just go intimate for a moment. And you have two people and both these individuals are really, they're in a magnificent state of mind and emotion. Their life is going beautifully. They're happy as could possibly be. And they enter a relationship, two really happy people. What's that relationship going to be like? You tell me, if you know nothing else, what kind of relationship is going to be if you've got two people in a great peak state? Tell me, what's it going to be like? Now, if I'm having a soliloquy, you won't get anything out of this. I'm asking you to not answer the question just so you refer back to me or affirm. I'm doing it because if you sit passively, you won't remember anything. But if you activate your nervous system by raising your hand, by asking questions, by yelling out the answer, then the you'll rise. Who's willing to do this? If you want to raise your hand, say I. Become a good student of your own life. It's the information you are most familiar with and feel the strongest about. 
So make your own life one of your most important studies. And in studying your own life, be sure to study the negative as well as the positive, your failures as well as your successes. Our so-called failures serve us well when they teach us valuable information. They're frequently better teachers than our successes. One of the ways we learn how to do something right is simply by doing it wrong. Doing it wrong is a great school for learning. Now I would suggest that you not take too long. If you've done it wrong for 10 years, I wouldn't suggest another 10. But what a close at hand and emotionally impactful way to learn from your own experiences. When I met Mr. Schoff, I had been working six years. I started when I was 19, and when I met him, I was 25. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, you have been working now for six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, then I suggest you not do that anymore. Six years is long enough to operate the wrong plan. Next, he asked, how much money have you saved in the last six years? I said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan six years ago? What a fantastic question. Where did I get my present plan that wasn't working well? Hey, everyone has bought someone's plan. The question is, whose? Whose plan have you bought? Now, those initial confrontations as you come to grips with your own past experiences may be a little painful at first, especially if you have made as many errors as I did. But think of the progress you can make when you have finally confronted those errors by becoming a better student of your own life. Now, the next way to learn is from other people's experiences. And remember, you can learn from other people whether they have done it right or wrong. You can learn from negative as well as positive. The Bible is such a great book because it is a collection of human stories on both sides of the ledger. One list of human stories is called examples, do what these people did. And the other list of human stories is called warnings, don't do what these clods did. What a wealth of information, what to do and what not to do. I think it also means, however, that if your story ever gets in somebody's book, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. There are three ways to learn from other people. The first is to listen to the cassettes and read the books by and about people who've accomplished great things. All the successful people I know and work with around the world are good readers. They just read, read, read. They are so curious that they are driven to read because they just have to know. It is one of the things they all have in common. Here's a good phrase, all leaders are readers. And they use cassette programs too, especially while they're in the car or during other times when they can't read. Cassettes can help all of us easily pick up new ideas and new skills. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Half rich isn't bad. 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day. Don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone, or food alone. It says, the next most important thing to bread is words. Words nourish the mind. Words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. I told my staff one day, some people read so little, they have rickets of the mind. And also remember to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Here is a thought. Why not call good books and cassettes tapping the treasure of ideas? That's it. Tapping the treasure of ideas like you're doing with this program. And if somebody's got a good excuse for not tapping the treasure of ideas for at least 30 minutes every day, or spending the money and getting the books and cassettes, I'd like to hear it. Some excuses you wouldn't believe. I say, John, I've got this gold mine. I've got so much gold, I don't know what to do with it all. Come on over and dig. John says, I don't have a shovel. I say, well, John, get you one. He says, do you know what they want for shovels? Hey, invest the money. Get the cassettes and books. The best money you can spend is money invested in your self-education. Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to investing in your own better future.
Mr. Shope got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. So I went to work on my library, and I now have one of the best. Shelf said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shope, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. Remember, don't be a follower, be a student. Someone says, I read this book, should I follow? And the answer is no. Read at least two books and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower, be a student.